Welcome to Diffuse Congruence Live. We are in Michigan. My name is Zaki Hassan. I'm here with Pervez Ahmed celebrating the American Muslim experience, uh, continuing our Michigan tour. That's right. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, for me, it's kind of being back home, uh, you know, uh, uh, I lived uh, not too far from here in Canton, and uh, where I used to actually work at a part when, when I was in grad school. I worked part time in Taylor, which is not which is right next door to where we are right now. Uh, but yeah, it's good to be back in Michigan, and good to be back with uh, fellow Michiganders. And uh, yeah, uh, would like to. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about today because this is sort of an unusual thing. Not only because it's a live episode. Uh, but also because we're doing kind of a panel conversation today. So this is going to be like... Uh, this is the first time we've ever done that. That's right. It's that's a big right. deal. <laughs> You're right. So, and um, also a big deal is the panelists that we have. So maybe Zucky kind of maybe go down the table and uh, introduce everybody. Who's yes. Well, well uh, we are joined uh, for this uh, special discussion with uh, Naja Bazi, who is founder of Zaman International, which is uh, where we are recording the show right now. She's CEO of Diversity Specialists and Transcultural Healthcare Solutions. She's a global leader in medical ethics, philanthropy, nursing, and interfaith dialogue. We're also joined by Daoud Walid, who is executive director of the Michigan chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations and is a member of the Michigan Muslim Community Council Imams Committee. And uh, lastly, but not leastly, we have Mark Crane, uh, co-founder of Empower Change, a rapid response digital campaigning organization serving the Muslim community. And he is the project director for Dream of Detroit, a Muslim-led community development initiative on the west side of the city. So, uh, Pervez, what is our umbrella topic for uh, assembling this this uh, this real Justice League uh, that we've brought together here. Yeah, um, I mean, I think we could we, we can go about it, and I think one of several ways. Um, uh, you know, typically for those again, like for the listening audience, you know that we we generally like to capture people's sort of origin story. You know, uh, what brought them to where they are today? To you know, what brought them to the work that they're doing today? What inspired them? And I think we can certainly do a part of that. Um, but I think that you know, if there is going to be sort of a uh, umbrella theme, if you will, or an uh, overarching theme to today's conversation, um, I actually kind of wanted to use, um, you know, Daoud, Imam Daoud's work um, and his, you know, recent book on uh, towards sacred activism kind of to, uh, um, uh, to, I guess, anchor the conversation around uh, just activism, social justice issues that are related to that. And, and certainly, uh, it's one of the areas that Imam Dawood does explore in the book. Um, but I think, um, you, know, you know, if I could ask you, uh, Imam Dawood, to kind of maybe speak to what was sort of the impetus for why you wrote the book and what you hope to sort of highlight in terms of, if you will, objectives or a conversation that you wanted to start within the Muslim community about issues of activism and how that relates to our uh, sacred, tradi- sacred tradition. Well, first of all, let me say it's a pleasure to be here uh, on you, uh, with you on Diffuse Congruence. And I've listened to your podcast, and it's one of the podcasts in the community that I listen to. So may Allah reward you both and protect you for the work that you've uh, Thank you. been doing. I actually was playing for the third time the podcast that you did with my good friend, our good friend, Brother Ali. I was playing that for my son, Adam, uh, a couple of days ago, actually. So, awesome. alhamdulillah. Um, so the, the impetus for myself uh, writing the book Towards Sacred Activism actually uh, is a project that I worked on for uh, quite a while as far as uh, research and condensing things, also speaking to scholars, including some of my teachers, uh, both here in America as well as in West Africa. Uh, but what sparked for me to... Uh, say we need to address the, the activism scene. It starts off with a um, a cohort that I was part of. Mm-hmm. And it was, let's say, about seven years ago. And I was in a cohort which has had uh, several different uh, cohorts uh, that started. And it's basically a lot of the who's who of the activist world in the uh, Muslim mm-hmm. community. And what I saw is people who are very sincere, who were treating activism as uh, something that is bound up in primarily secular framework, secular uh, epistemologies really coming from the the left. And um, instead of seeing activism as something part of the Islamic faith, I felt that what I was seeing is people making activism a religion. 
hmm. Aideen, sure. right? Uh, in which uh, then certain uh, means can justify what is considered to be a noble end, right? Hmm. So uh, I saw a number of things that really uh, bothered me uh, through that cohort. So that is what uh, sparked it. Actually, I went and I started, basically I rang a bell. I met with, with, with a number of scholars. I'm not going to mention their name, but after, during it uh, and afterwards, actually, what well, Dr. Jackson, probably the first person I actually spoke to, I will mention that, uh, in terms of like what I saw going on, mm-hmm. right? And um, some of my concerns of what I saw happening or why I saw the community and the activism scene going with the uh, the call-out culture, the lack of uh, parameters, um, the uh, disrespect that I see of our scholarly tradition in many terms. Um, I saw it maybe about two years afterwards. I've seen it start taking a downward snowball in mm-hmm. the past, like mm-hmm. four or five years in particular. Yeah. Uh, so. you, you know, it's interesting because I mean, I, and I think you, you're, you're alluding to certain things that I, I, you know, I think we can maybe delve into a little bit further. Um, because I, you know, I've often said, like as a as a child of or a product of uh, coming of age in '90s Islam in America, um, and that whole scene and the conversations that were happening, I felt like you know um, that was still a time in our history where you know we we were talking about issues like is the you know the permissibility of music and eating outside the non the biha meat or you know the intermingling or the uh, you know segregation of the genders and so on, and I, I you know these conversations were almost glacial in terms of like, we were still talking about it like 20, 30, 40 Mm -hmm. years down the road. And I'm not necessarily saying that that's the place to be. However, I juxtapose that from conversations that have happened more recently where, you know, for example, you know, conversations around LGBTQ and whether or not Muslims should align themselves with left-leaning causes or causes that, um, you know, may, one may certainly argue are compromising or are, um, you know, perhaps even antithetical to uh, Islam and Islam's tradition. And yet those conversations, I feel, lack not only the nuance, but have lacked that kind of glacial, like, let's let's really kind of talk about this issue from the, you know, from the various vantage points and look at it and, and see it from not only from a strategic and an ends versus or an ends justifying the means sort of approach, but also from a is this in is this in congruence, if you will, with our tradition, and yet that hasn't happened, and it's been this sort of rushing to, um, you know, embracing certain, uh, certain, um, you know, like you said, epistemologies or approaches to activism. So, I mean, what, why do you think that has been the case? I mean, I think certainly post nine eleven and and what has happened to the community, and I think uh, coupled with, and, if you, and I would love for for you to comment on whether you agree with this framing. But coupled with the fact that um, the, the the right in America, the conservative, uh, uh, the conservative part of the political scene, um, has uh, aligned itself with forces that are not only alien and antithetical to Muslims, uh, but see us as a real threat and as a real fifth column in this country. So maybe that's sort of all has snowballed together to kind of cause the kind of, uh, I, I guess, rushing to embracing these causes that we see without, you know, a real nuanced conversation. Yes, I think there's a, a few things that I'll just try to address succinctly. And I know we have two I know, other, exactly. uh, people on the, uh, on the uh, panel who are very uh, capable of discussing and elaborating as well. Um, but part of the impetus also of myself writing this book is to help start a conversation, right? And I actually, I mentioned in the book that I actually walk and critique, and I hope that <laughs> someone takes the, the book and critiques it and actually improves, right? But that uh, there hasn't been any sort of book that was written uh, delving on this discourse from our Asuli tradition, mm. right? That um, it's, it's, it, it, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a, a first, and this is like when I asked Imam Zaid, uh, uh, Shaka, may Allah preserve him, mm. uh, when I asked him to, to write this, and he was, uh, I was discussing the, the contents, he was very uh, excited. But I think that some of this uh, does, uh, in the activism scene, does relate to a, a reaction, and it's a, also a generational difference with inside the community. Uh, a lot of it is uh, formed by post-9-11 
uh, community discourse and ourselves seeing ourselves as in a, in a crisis type of mode. I mentioned that and elaborate on that some within the introduction of the book. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also a little something that even goes deeper of the lack of tarbiyah hmm. or the lack of Islamic education and grounding that people have had, which then they go into uh, activism and they feel compelled, almost as if everything is intimate, everything deserves an immediate reaction, that it has to be, uh, we have to jump yeah. and do this right now, right? Um, and I want to quote something. I brought this because this kind of speaks to a matter relating to activism, which I believe is rooted in the concept we have in Islam of uh, enjoining the mahroof or enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. That's really the basis of activism. And Sidi Ahmed uh, Azaruk, uh, rahmatullah alayhi, a great uh, Moroccan uh, Maliki scholar, he said that, and this is for those of you who have his book on Qawa'ad uh, Tasawwuf, mm. in the, uh, the 79th uh, principle, or qaida, he says that it is not permissible for anyone to proceed in the matter except that they know the ruling of Allah pertaining to that matter, right? Mm. So this is part of like, if we're going to enjoin the good and forbid the evil, and we look at a particular issue, we have to first be humble and have to submit ourselves, okay, well, what is the Islamic ruling, right? What is the general basis of how uh, not only the outcome that we're working towards and whether it's something permissible, whether it's something recommended, but also involved in the shura process is the means and the adab or the etiquettes of helping to implement this, which we think is going to promote good in the society mm -hmm. or permit uh, or forbid the evil, hmm. does it jive with inside the Sharia? Which means that we have to have some sort of knowledge. We just can't have activism from feeling, right? It, like, and I feel that we are in a type of we're in the age of feeling right now. I feel a certain way. Hmm. I, I'm sincere, but as one of my as one of my uh, teachers said, uh, Imam Salim Al Rahman, Rahmatullah Alayhi, he he told me in one session. He says, Daud, you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong, <laughs> and this is why we need tarbiyah. Mm -hmm. We need uh, and we need to have spiritual guidance, uh, spiritual mentors, mm -hmm. and take shura. But it has to be within the in the framework of the general mm -hmm. principles of the Quran, Sunnah, and the consensus of what Muslims, Sunni, and Shia have always agreed upon. Like there there are many matters that the Muslim community is different upon, but there are certain things that are non-negotiable that there is Correct. there is ijma on like is like everything is not up for democratic vote hmm. uh within the like our ethics and values aren't up for right. democratic vote what we refer to as manu minadin bidurura like known no of our, bidurura. that's right that's right so what known of our religion out of necessity so or the non-negotiables as you said exactly um yeah I mean, and i think i, I don't want to you mentioned imam zaid um it would be remiss not to, to say a little bit a few words about the book real quickly um a uh, beautiful forward by uh, Imam Zaid Shakir, former guest of the show, of course, um, uh, and mentor to the show in many ways. And, and of course, our, our very own uh, Lena Safi. Instead of Lena, is, that's is right. in, the, in the house A future right now. guest of the show. So a uh, future <laughs> guest of the show, uh, Lena. And, uh, but yeah, and, and people can find the book uh, through... Meccabooks.com. Meccabooks.com. So yes. thank you. Um, but yeah, uh, if I could bring in, like you mentioned, I'd love to you know bring in our uh, other co-panelists to this conversation. Um, you know, maybe if I could start with you, you know, Najab, since one, I want to thank you again for hosting us in your uh, wonderful facility here at Zaman. Um, but maybe uh, if you could maybe pick up the conversation from where. Uh, you know, Imam Dawood left us in terms of inf what informs kind of the work that you've done. I mean, you've been someone who has been involved in the community, you know, mashallah, for decades. Um, you know, if I can have a, a little confessional moment, first time I, I ever saw you was, in fact, here in Michigan um, at the world premiere of uh, Muhammad, you know, uh, Legacy of the Prophet. Uh, right, that was the name of the document? Uh, the, the I, Michael I, Wolf. I, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. And, and you were one of the people featured in that in that documentary, and that was right after 9-11, and it was, it was really a wonderful uh, uh, documentary film by Michael Wolf and Alex Cronenberg. But um, maybe if you can kind of talk about, you know, your work, uh, not only as a as someone involved in the healthcare industry, you know, as a nurse, um, and but what sort of led to the work that Zaman is doing and, and, and why... 
um, you know, how, how that's related to, I guess, you know, some of the work that you were doing prior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me, and, and I want to thank all the organizers. And Zaman is not my place. Zaman is everyone's place. <laughs> and I think that's really, that is part of the activism, mm. is the mindset of how you build an organization and who does it belong to. Yeah. And does it really align with the sacred mission, uh, whether that is Islam or anything else? Does right. it align with humanity? Right. And does it align with al-munkar, as Imam Dawood said? Yeah. And, and, and can it breed goodness? Because wherever there is goodness, you will find more goodness. Just like wherever there is evil, you can find more evil. Mm-hmm. But in terms of um, kind of the what moves the heart, in terms of this work, it actually, I think, I think about this a lot. I think it's really, um, to Dawood's point, the way that I was raised. Mm. And I think all credit really goes to my family. Very open-minded parents, one Sunni, one Shia, that raised us with a house full of love. That took in refugees before refugee resettlement was a thing. Mm that always fed people in our home before they fed us, that walked for muscular dystrophy, knocking on doors because my brother had muscular dystrophy, even though they couldn't speak one word of English, and still went to our mosques and actually built them, cooking and and serving. And this idea of service is something that we were raised with. And my father was a serviceman. He served in the military of the United States of America. And I kind of chuckled a little bit when you talked about um, being raised with Islam, like in the 90s, while I was being raised in the 60s. Um, so you really dated yeah. me there. No, um, no, no. But, but that's okay. I was a little bloomer, let's you, just put it that way. So You're all either my younger brothers or sisters, and, and sometimes even my children. You know, Najat, um, like, I, like we sit here miles away from, you know, Dearborn, and I think, you know, like your own unique sort of history um, and connection to Southeast Michigan, I think that I, I would really like for you to kind of get into that. And I think you were with, 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 with your father's background, but... Um, you know, so you were you were a, a child of immigrants here in Southeast Michigan. My mom and dad were actually born here. Okay, so raised that, over in Syria and in Lebanon, and then came back like hmm. the American dream um, uh-huh. by parents who were willing to bring them in a, in a boat ride that took you know a couple of months to get here. But my point is, and this may rub people the wrong way. I don't see a disconnect. I don't see a discongruence. I see the congruence mm. between being American and being Muslim. Right. Mm. I don't Absolutely. have a problem with that. Absolutely. We, were, we, we, were, we weren't raised to have a problem with it. So for me, being part and parcel of this country is a very natural thing to do. Mm. I don't see that Zaman has to be a Muslim organization. I see that Zaman is a sacred organization that can serve all people. But when you, when you ask the question about what really stirs the, the activism, I really think it's this hadith that I'm always playing in my mind. Mm. If you see an injustice, I talked about a Muhammad legacy. I'm always talking about this. Yeah. You must fix it with your hand. And if you cannot fix it with your hand, you must speak out against it with your tongue. And if you cannot speak out against it with your tongue, you must condemn it in your heart. And the third pathway is the weaker of the other two. Mm-hmm. And so I think that there is a call to align. Now, when Imam Dawood talks, I, I listen. <laughs> and um, I made a note um, when he was talking about... She's a about, mentor of mine, by the um, way. So <laughs> just keep that in mind. Just, just, when I talk, she listens. She is my mentor. Okay. I'm not exaggerating by saying that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're talking about sacred activism, and I keep thinking about what does that really, really mean? And I think it really means sacred alignment. And I think when we stand before God and we put our hands up to our ears and we do Allahu Akbar and we push this world away and we come to God, Mm -hmm. I think that sacred alignment should drive all things. Now, you talked about the left and the right, and I want Mark to yeah, know, exactly. weigh in here. But, but I wanted to ask you really quickly before we move, like, if you could define a little bit further maybe sacred alignment. Do you mean like as human beings aligning with the sacred? Is that, yes, okay, exactly. Okay. Right, right, right. I mean, if everything according to our scripture, mm-hmm. if everything in every atom bows to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mm-hmm. A-T-O-M, if everything knows God, 
then there shouldn't be the polarities that we have. Hmm. If there is respect for the divine, hmm. then everyone deserves equity. If mm -hmm. there's respect for the divine and we know who's created all of us as a human family and the diverse colors and languages and even religions and even a lack of religion. Nabi Ibrahim, he was dining with an atheist and when he found out he was an atheist, he dismissed the atheist, and God sent Jibreel right down to Ibrahim and said to him, feed him. I know he does not believe in me, and I continue to provide his sustenance. Call him back. Mm. But we're not hearing those stories anymore. Mm. We're, not, we're not paying attention to the connectedness mm -hmm. that we all have. And so I'm a firm believer that I know where I am going. I'm going right into the ground and the earth and I will be there. And so I need to be of it and a part of it. So I'm not one who's either left or right in the issues because I believe that Islam coming, in, in, if we were to, even though it is the beginning, the middle end, the end of the divine message, I believe that that message, the voice of that message leaves room for, for everyone. Even those that we may find fault with, mm -hmm. Allah may be merciful with. So at least at the very minimum, rather than shut the door on people, mm -hmm. at least be merciful enough to feed, clothe, and shelter them mm -hmm. at a basic level. That's right. A at least that. Right. And then wherever people fall on issues, I mean, I have my own personal opinions about things that are happening in this country, very strong opinions. But I also find that the mizan of, of Islam, mm -hmm. that balance, that Sorry. balance yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. it actually has answers, but we're not looking for those answers mm. because oftentimes the agenda and the podium is about the person, mm. not about the divine. And, and that is very dangerous. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and I, and I want to come back to like, like more specifically the work that Zaman is doing because I do want to highlight that. But um, but before we do that, I mean, I, I want to bring in Mark and join and have Mark, Mark Crane join the conversation as well. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us and taking the time out. Um, and and if you could, you know, maybe uh, if you want, I mean, feel free to respond to anything that uh, either Naja or Imam Dawood have have stated so far. Uh, or if you'd really like to kind of talk about the work that Dream of Detroit does, because I'm, I'm really excited to hear about that um, as well. And I think our listeners would be equally you know, excited to hear about the work that you're doing there. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah. So, alhamdulillah, that's a, that's a softball he just pitched me, so that's, <laughs> I, can, I can talk about Dream. Uh, I'll say that... Um, you know, we can play hardball a little no, later. I, you know, right, yeah, once yeah. we warm <laughs> up a little bit, I got to be warming little, you up. You know? yeah. That's right. We're just warming uh, you up. So. I, I will say that yeah. you know, alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm I'm glad to be on the podcast with you all, and I uh, I agreed to to join the podcast when a dear friend asked me, but I was not originally told that it'd be a panel with Sister Najah and Imam Dawood, and and I may have I may have seriously reconsidered. <laughs> uh, I don't know that. This is quite, I'm very honest about that. So, um, but I but I am. Uh, Grateful to be here, and I, and I can certainly talk about the work that we're doing with Dream of Detroit, mm -hmm. um, or that we're trying to do with Dream. So, uh, so Dream is an organization that's been around for um, a little over five years now, uh, closer to six. Um, it's an organization that, for much of that time, I've sort of been the primary volunteer of, but I actually wasn't. I wasn't here when the idea was originated. I was actually still in Chicago. Um, and I was connected to one of the founders of Dream because they were a supporter of the work that we were doing at Iman, the Inner City Muslim Action Network okay. in Chicago, which I know a lot of people will be more familiar with. Mm -hmm. So I worked there for a, a brief while, a couple of years. Uh, Although, are you originally, you hail from Michigan? Yeah, or I'm from Detroit. Chicago? Yeah, oh, I'm from, from the east side of Detroit. Right. Uh, I was born on the west side, raised on the east side. Uh, the whole city is mine. No, um, <laughs> uh, um, and, I, and I moved to Chicago, to the Chicagoland area for school, and okay. then uh, became Muslim in my final year of college. Oh, uh, at Northwestern. At Northwestern. Okay, okay. And then uh, from there was blessed to, to land a job shortly thereafter working at Iman, um, which I had just been introduced to right before I became Muslim. And so alhamdulillah, for a couple of years, I got to work sort of under the tutelage of Brother Rami Nashashibi and all the good people at that organization he's built. Um, and, then I, and then I left there and uh, got into 
what I do today professionally, which is sort of digital campaigning and mm-hmm. mobilizing, um, and then came back home. Gotcha. Um, so when I came home, Dream was Dream. The, the folks at Dream had just finished rehabbing their first home. Uh, right down the street from the Muslim Center. Okay. Uh, and it was a collaborative West side effort. Of, West side of Detroit. West side of Detroit. Mm-hmm. The Muslim Center is a masjid that it, it's probably it, uh, technically not the largest in the city proper, but it's, it's the largest that's considered kind of a Detroit masjid. Mm. Uh, there, there are a couple that are sort of on the border, but, you know, are sort of considered masjids of other cities. So, mm. um, and, and, and the Muslim Center has a 30-year really rich history that uh, it comes out of Imam Warafdi Muhammad's community. Today is led by a Gambian scholar named uh, Sheikh Mamadou Sisse and is really, mm. uh, you know, is, is in the process of really merging together several different strands of the, of the Muslim experience, if you will. Um, and, I, and, and I had a, a connection to the Muslim Center that I didn't really know about, actually, because uh, I think really since they were open, my family had been doing the locks at the Muslim Center. I come from a locksmithing family. So Imam Abdul El Amin was a founder there, goes way back with my grandfather and right. done a lot of business together over the oh. years. Um, so it was actually a non-Muslim at my locksmith shop who told me when I first came home, you should go to the Muslim Center. <laughs> so, um, so, so, so the project was really a coming together of, of elders from the black Muslim community, particularly out of the Muslim Center at Masjid Wali Muhammad, the original temple number one of the That's Nation right. of Islam, and then uh, the Pakistani community, particularly out of the western suburbs, uh, through a group called ICANN, the Indus Community Action Network. So Neighborly Needs and ICANN came together, right. and they did the Dream Project, which was this first home. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I came home right when they were for, sort of starting to look for the first tenant of that home mm-hmm. and got involved. And, and then we started to sort of figure out what the long term vision of the project was from there. So when you say Western suburbs, that's like Canton, Canton Michigan, yeah, Plant, Plymouth. Plymouth. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Plymouth, exactly. Canton's my old home yeah. Yeah, where I live. But uh, OK. Um, and, and, and I I heard also through the grapevine, just if I could, um, uh, I think my youngest brother uh, uh, went to the same high school as you did. So Is that right? Right? Yeah, yeah. Cranbrook. So, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, right. So, <laughs> so, so, my, so my parents. Uh, uh, you know, drove me to Cranbrook from the east side of Detroit for seven years. That's 45 amazing. Minutes I know that's I not a world. that's not a small feat. No, it's not. No, no, <laughs> no it's not. As so. I'm learning, because I'm driving 30 minutes each way to Kenton <laughs> for, to take my kids to school. So we started earlier doing that than I anticipated. But alhamdulillah. Right. Um, but yeah, so just to wrap it up, though, the work yeah. of Dream is essentially bringing together uh, housing development, economic development, and community organizing to. Uh, rebuild the community around the masjid, um, and to and to revitalize that neighborhood. And and our and it's the goal is sort of twofold. It's one to build a healthy, thriving, Muslim-led community in that area, but also beyond that to involve Muslims from throughout the metro region um, in, in the revitalization of Detroit's neighborhoods at large, and in sort of addressing some of the systemic issues that have made the neighborhoods look the way that they do today. Mm. <laughs> Wow, that's that's. Uh, I mean, I'm just I'm kind of blown away by by the breadth of of the work um, that our panel is doing, and mm-hmm. I think I think in terms of the broader topic that uh, you know we're discussing, which is this the the notion of of, of activism and uh, what that means uh, in this day and age, and and specifically uh, Imam Daoud. I mean, you were you were uh, talking about how activism has to some extent become a mantle that some people take on as a way. Not to speak for other people, but to sort of put, you know, propagate their own brand, so to speak, um, often at the expense of of our cultural tradition, our the our our scholars. I mean, one one thing I've seen, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is there's the sense of, oh, our scholars, they don't they don't know they don't know what it's like. They oh they they've been wrong. Like not, we're we are the new. Uh, keepers of the faith, if you will, mm-hmm. and and that's something that you know Pervez can speak to this. This is a bee in my bonnet because it's just it's it's a lack of it's lack of decorum, uh, but above that, it's it's a lack of self awareness. Um, and and uh, I wonder if you know when you when you talk about this idea of of uh, trying to strive towards sacred activism, mm-hmm. if that's you know that notion of the sacred being missing in in uh, uh, what we call activism today. Uh, well, it does exist amongst some, so I'm not going to say that it's a, a a complete desert. But hmm. from my perspective, there's uh, a lot of wasteland with only a few oases. Hmm. And I'm proud to say that Dream of Detroit and Zaman are actually some of those oases, at least here in the state of Michigan. Sure. And, and I'm saying that without any exaggeration. Um, I'd like to touch on uh, two things relating to what you, you said. The first is... 
um, when we talk about the difference between sacred activism and Muslims being Activ involved um. in activism, mm. uh, sacredness, that which is sacred, um, within it, it states that there are certain boundaries that mm. can't be transgressed, like a haram or hurma. Like this is what we t call something where there's a haram, there's a certain things that you should do more and there's certain things you can't do mm. at a haram, right? And then there's a certain way, there's certain rules, there's a certain adab, uh, decorum, and it's at a heightened level because you understand or the one who understands they're in the haram understands the hurma or the, the, the guidelines mm. and the sacredness of the, of the area that they're in, right? So when we talk about... And you're using that as a translation. I should, I should be, yes, just yes. To be clear. Like, yeah. Harm or, oh, yeah. Harma, Harma as being sacred. As being exactly. sacred, exactly, right? So, yeah. like, Masjid al Masjid al Haram, is right? It's a sacred and sanctuary. It's a sacred yeah. sanctuary. Uh -huh. So, there's individual human beings we have, we all have our, our Harma yeah. that we are given by Almighty God. And then, Almighty God also uh, has given certain sanctity, which means that there are certain rights that. Uh, certain things are due, even if those things or those people don't necessarily afford us our rights, we still have certain rights that we have to afford individuals or certain people and there's a and there's a and there's a guidelines uh, towards that now the other piece and I mentioned uh mentorship, I also think part of the problem the disrespect of the scholars uh, and, and we're not going to put all of the blame. On, on one side, because we have, uh, first of all, we have uh, celebrity speakers that people think are scholars that aren't scholars within our community. That's the mm. first thing. Mm. Um, and then we uh, do sometimes have people who are uh, scholars who maybe don't understand cultural context of certain people and can say things that are insensitive. But generally, um, it is within our, our spiritual tradition, and I mentioned the Rotorbia or upbringing, mm -hmm. training, is that every activist uh, should have a spiritual mentor or a spiritual guide, mm -hmm. right? They should, have, they should have a murabbi, or we can use the word murshid, whatever word we'd like to use, a sheikh, a uh, mustadha, uh, needs that uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is to be reminded of these sacred parameters, mm -hmm. right? So it should be either someone who's learned in the dean or at least an elder who's known to have upright character. But of course, the scholar, the knowledgeable person, should also be known to have upright character. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that, and uh, as my friend Dr. Bilal Ware, may Allah preserve him, uh, always discusses, I actually had a nice conversation with him yesterday, and we were touching on, on some of this. But in, in Senegal, they have a saying that even, even the sharpest sword cannot cut its own handle. Right. Huh. So everyone needs some sort of uh, of, of of guidance uh, and the nefs, uh, the nefs by nature is prone towards self-deception. So part of this is we need to be able to uh, and we're not talking about blind following, but say, oh, OK, I don't know everything. I don't know all the answers. I need to go to an elder. I need to go to a scholar and just check in just for my own nef's sake, for my own uh, uh, ego sake, because the, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, problem for any activist, and I have a sheikh, by the way. I'm not going to be shy about saying that. I have a sheikh, and I have someone I check in with at least once a week. Hmm. But um, – in this whole endeavor, in us of, of trying to check our, our nefs, is that if we don't try to break our nefs, that it's very easy for an activist to fall into being sanctimonious or self-righteous. Because if you're always working and you think that the haq or the truth or the rights is always with you, I'm advocating for this right, I'm advocating for these people, you can be self-deluded and think that you are always right or actually you are the haq. That's right. right. And so this is why we need uh, spiritual uh, mentorship. And I think that any activist who is out in the public sphere, if they don't have a spiritual mentor, especially when, when, you're, when, when someone is younger, right, uh, I think this it leads to self, 
a delusionment, and actually the self-delusionment will take someone outside of the sacred parameters of the Sharia. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm convinced of it. I don't think anyone can do this activism thing right without teskia and without spiritual mentorship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, 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 I want to. I, I, there's a couple things I do want to come back to, which you just raised. But, but before we get into it, I wanted to kind of go back to a point that you raised earlier, probably at the outset of the conversation, and, and, and uh, you know, Sister Naja kind of echoed it with this idea of Amr bin Ma'ruf wa Nahyan al Munkar. Okay, so the enjoining of the good and the prohibition or forbidding the evil. Uh, ma'ruf, I mean, my understanding, again, and please, Imam Dawud, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of the ma'ruf as for, you know, within the discourse of the Qur'an is uh, thinking of it as a sociological term, that which is known to be of good, yes. that which is of known to be of value or benefit or, or goodness. Um, and I think that, you know, and, and again, and this kind of draws into a conversation you, or you started again or terms you've used about negotiables and non-negotiables. I think there's certain things that we can all agree on, regardless of political stripe, regardless of, you know, Shi'i, Sunni, perhaps even our ideological frames, which is, look, feeding the poor, taking care of the disenfranchised, uh, the, the, the work that, you know, a dream, that the Dream of Detroit is doing, certainly the work that Zaman is doing. Look, this is stuff that we can agree on right out the box, um, you know, and so... I think that, uh, you know, if you, uh, expounding on kind of like that idea of the common good, Naja, if you could maybe speak to this about, you know, just because you, you raised this in your kind of introductory kind of comments about like, look, I mean, I, you know, this work, people like I do this work because regardless of where you are, you're a human being and you have certain needs and, and, and you, know, you, you need to be able to find a place where you can go to have some of those needs met, the need for shelter, for food, for community perhaps, right? And so that's kind of the, some of the work that Zaman is doing. Well, it's even deeper than that. Mm-hmm. And it's deeper than that because the Quran is very specific. The widow, the orphan, the wayfarer. There you go, right. Okay, the Quran does not say the Muslim widow, the Muslim orphan, the Muslim wayfarer. That's right. That's right. And when Allah created Adam, we know that Allah in Quran speaks. This is his voice speaking that says, I am creating the Khalifa on earth. The angels disagree, right? Or they, they're at least shocked. Let's call it that, whatever we want to call it, right? Yeah. Are you sure? Right. <laughs> you, know, you know what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. Yes, I know what they're going to do. But obviously, Allah knows the good in us, too. Mm -hmm. But if we are khalifas to one another and for one another, that very deep sense, that is what's sacred. Any physician, any healthcare provider is not looking at the religion of the patient in the bed. That, to me, is so powerful that we are entrusted. We are trustees of one another. Now, I, I am scared for Islam in America when the wrong voices are at the podium, when voices of exclusively our Islam, exclusively our school of thought, exclusively this way and no other way, that is a dangerous zone to be there. The prophets were not like that. God is not like that. So this idea, especially in a diversity and inclusion world right now, mm-hmm. when, we, when we're touting this line of um, Islam is exclusively ours and, and inclusively ours, there is a danger in that. And so what I think is happening is a lot of people who go to a microphone or pick up a platform for activism, I think they're pushing against that. They don't like that. And so what they do instead is create a platform that has a little bit of a different voice that says, no, we, Islam is diverse. We're going to fight for this issue. We're going to fight for that issue. What's missing in their activism, again, I come back to the sacred alignment. You got to know your lane. Hmm. I am not a scholar, but I have a teacher Mm -hmm every single day that I am in contact with. If I'm going to take the podium, I'm going to speak about women's issues or medical ethics or Islamic parameters around brain death, I had better know what I am talking about. I am a nurse. I am not a scholar. I did not study in the seminary. So knowing your lane Mm. 
is a sense of humbleness and it's humility. That's great and point. to understand that there are those who have answers. Maybe you don't agree with their answers, so go find it, go probe, mm -hmm. research. And the other thing that's a little bit frightening to me is there is a sense, and it goes back to humility, there is a sense of self-righteousness, which kind of actually leads to that nafsi arrogance, that I am right. Mm, that's a tough place. I always tell people, whenever I think I've done something, I check myself. Because the minute I actually think I've accomplished something, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's the stop sign. Mm -hmm. Whenever I think I really know something for certain, that complete certainty, I should be a little bit afraid. Put up, I should just be like a cautious, yellow flag, like right? a yellow yeah. light, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? The caution. But when I'm on, when I'm secure, I know my dean. I have access to the scholars, just like they should have access to other scholars, just like they would go to a physician who is an expert in something. There you go. Um, subspecialists, even in the scholarship in Islam, there are all these subspecialists. Absolutely. But to think that I actually know means that I'm giving myself permission to speak. Hmm. I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. I believe that alignment, um, and I, I've told many people in this audience, my, my grandmother says it best. She says in, in Arabic, it's a method. She says a mm. proverb, like a, a, her, her yeah. own. She says, if you, if you toot your horn, your ears will hear it. <laughs> I like that. But if others toot your horn, uh -huh. the world will hear it. Wow. So there's a humbleness, I guess is what I'm saying, and a humility that comes from alignment with Allah. Mm. To know that he is the most powerful, he is the all-knowing. And we say that, we say he is the all-knowing, but sometimes we think we're the all-knowing. Mm. That is, it could be considered um, a subliminal slip mm. and even form of shark. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful. I'm not saying don't go out there and promote causes. Women should be doing this. Men should be doing this. Youth should be doing this. All I'm saying is the guidance is very critical. And what we say is often hard to take back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're in a very, um, you know, difficult time right now. So I, I, I think we have to put the lid on the id kind of a thing and, and really open our heart. Yeah. I know we have psychiatrists in the office and move forward <laughs> with that alignment. Yeah. No, I, I'm really glad that, like, you know, Doe, that you, check, you know, like, like you touched on the points that you did about, you know, self-delusion and I think kind of believing in your own hype, which is kind of what you're talking about, Naja. But, um, you know, this idea of mentorship. Don't believe the hype like the old public, public enemy song. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Don't believe the hype. Yeah. Talk about 90s. Yeah. Coming up <laughs> in the 90s. Um, but, but you know, I, I think now, but also equally important uh, of, of something you raised, this idea of mentorship. And I think, you know, um, one, certainly one way of mentorship is what you described, which is like spiritual mentorship. And you need that. But I think there's also, uh, when, you, when we talk about mentorship and certainly when we talk about organizations and activism and people do, out there doing work and kind of knowing your lane, as it were, is, to, uh, is, is alignment, right? It, it is a different kind of alignment than you were mentioning, like sacred alignment or spiritual alignment with the divine. But, but, but aligning ourselves with other organizations that, can, that have done the work and have, and have been doing the work success, you know, successfully. Um, and so, Mark, I think, like, given your background of, of having worked at Iman, right, mm -hmm. an organization that has done just outstanding work um, in Chicago, um, you know, how does that relationship continue with the work that you're doing here in Detroit? You know, like, for example, is that, like, the le not, not only what you learned experientially, you know, experientially, um, in, at, you know, during your tenure at, at Iman, but also perhaps even on, on a current level in terms of your relationship with Rami or with the folks at Iman. I'd love for you to kind of talk about that. Um, one of the things, you know, we've mentioned Iman, and, and certainly Rami and I have talked about the idea of having him on the podcast, mm -hmm. but that's going to happen. But, I mean, you know, before we – so there, there's going to be yeah. definitely down the road an episode dedicated just to, to, to yeah. just that story. But I think having you and, and you know on the show, we'd be remiss not to kind of at least talk about some of the stuff that Iman's doing and how – that has informed the work you're doing right here in Detroit. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it certainly has um, in, in a number of ways. You know, I'll, I'll say real quickly, uh, you know, when I first met Brother Rami, I was not 
or when I first learned of him, I wasn't Muslim, actually. Uh, I was in my last year of college, and the MSA was, was organizing an event. And, um, and a buddy of mine was sort of leading that process. And another friend of ours, brother of ours, had just organized a big BSU event and had brought Jeremiah Wright out. And this was right after uh, Barack Obama's election, and Jeremiah Wright had been in the news a lot. And so it was a, it was a very large event. And the, and the brother in the MSA felt challenged to, to sort of replicate. And so he, he invited uh, um, Bernadine Dorn and Bill Ayers. Uh, Bill Ayers, who was at the time, uh, he, if you, you might remember from the 08 cycle, people were saying that Barack Obama was palling around with terrorists. Right? right. This was Bill Ayers. Right. He's a radical. And again, w- and like, Jer- you know, just maybe some of our listeners may not remember, but Jer- you know, Jer- Jeremiah, Jeremiah Wright, Wright was the Reverend Wright. The, the, yeah, yeah, the, the Reverend Wright. Reverend who, Wright who had, and of course, Bill Ayers, the yeah, yeah, uh, and, underground. And, I forget. And weather yeah. Underground. Weather, exactly. weather Underground. He was a That's radical right. activist in the 60s, a part of an organization that uh, um, attacked federal infrastructure uh, as a means of rebelling against the war in Vietnam. Um, and in any case, I had studied social movements in college, and so I was quite interested in hearing Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn speak. Mm-hmm. And Rami Nashashibi was the third person on the program. And a lot of the folks in the MSA were they were concerned, and they were, you know, why why would we align ourselves with this white guy that they're calling a terrorist? We don't need that. And and a buddy of mine he said, well, why don't we ask Rami since he's the one who's got to be on stage with him? So they they emailed Rami, and he replied. Rami's known for like one sentence replies, and he replied, and she's like, yeah, I know Bill, he's great, I'll do it. And they had been on a board together or something. And so I walked into that event really to see Bernadine Dorn and Bill Ayers and left only remembering Rami Nashashibi and the incredible presentation he gave that evening. Yeah. And then, alhamdulillah, some months later, I got the chance to, to start working at Iman. I'll say that, you know, we um, Iman was very important for me as a young Muslim and, and as a person who had been involved in social justice work. Uh, it was It was a very good place for me to sort of reconcile the background that I was coming from with this new faith that I was entering. Um, uh, and particularly they had it and also, a, and still have, you know, an emphasis on the arts as an organizing tool, which to me was very valuable. Um, and so, and so I learned a lot at Iman. And I, and I think for, you know, for a moment we thought about like, what would Iman in Detroit look like? There's an Atlanta chapter now. Um, Detroit is a very provincial place. I don't think, I don't think we can't just import something like Iman to Detroit. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta be homegrown. And frankly, I had to, Prove myself over a number of years when I first got back here. I show up on the scene trying to trying to be all active, and people are like, "Who's this guy? We didn't That's we don't know him. He didn't come, he didn't grow up here." That's right. You know, I grew up working down the street from Master Wally Muhammad actually, but had no real interactions. Um, and so, and also the work looked differently. So, any man, you know, Eddie Man, they have a free health clinic that's well regarded, and they do uh, a lot of organizing work, particularly around food access. Um, uh, you know, they do a lot of work in the arts. In Detroit, I was coming into a community that had a free health clinic that had been okay. running for some years, nice. uh, that had a masjid that literally has a cafe in it called the Halal Jazz Cafe. So I was not entering a community that had any sort of, you know, tension with the arts necessarily yeah. with engagement in the arts. Nice. Um, and our neighborhood looked much different than the very densely populated neighborhood on the southwest side of Chicago that Iman was working in. Right. And so um, for us, you know, the assessment was just that Iman's, Iman's direct model wouldn't necessarily work in our neighborhood. It didn't necessarily make sense, uh, let alone the, the branding issues and all those things. And so we had to step back and say, you know, what, it, what is important to do here? Um, and, the, and the most urgent thing was sort of solving the vacancy crisis in our neighborhood. Uh, and, then, and then, you know, in, in concert with that was creating a space for Muslims to move in the neighborhood because our, the masjid, frankly, is not one that I think historically has had a huge emphasis on people living around it necessarily. There's a faithful community that supports it, that drives in every Friday for Juma and different programs. But I don't think there was, a, you know, outside of a few people here and there who had come and gone, there wasn't a huge emphasis on really building a living community within walking distance to the masjid and sort of sustaining it like that. But but we came home, I came home at a moment where that was, where there, where there again, and there was this convergence of folks from several different communities at the Muslim Center, and that sort of spirit became much more important, but it needed to be facilitated. And so that's what we were and are continuing to try to figure out how to scale that. Um, I'll, I'll say, though, you know, uh, and to your question about, you know, uh, Rami, God bless him. I mean, Rami's the busiest man in America, you know, and I, I wish I had more access to his time. And I consider him a mentor and, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, don't hold him accountable for any mistakes I make. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, you know, I'll say, though, you know, 
part of the discourse around activism, around social justice work in general, um, that I find difficult sometimes is, is, is just the definition of terms. And that's one of the things that I appreciate mm-hmm. about Imam. There's a lot that I appreciate about Imam Dawood's book, not to mention that in the first two pages, he, as he mentioned earlier, uh, welcomes critique and conversation, mm-hmm. but also that he starts chapters, you know, uh, with the common practice from, from our tradition of defining terms, right? Like, let's make sure we're talking about the same things that's before right. we start to engage in a conversation. Um, you know, an activist is a an activist can be a number of things, but an activist can be a lone wolf. An activist can just be a person with an agenda. An activist can be a charismatic person that creates their own audience or that knows how to use mass media. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I wouldn't necessarily encourage folks in our community or particularly young folks to just go out and become activists. Uh, but I would encourage you to go out and become an organizer or to learn about organizing, which I think looks a lot different. Because an organizer is actually accountable to community, right? An organizer is, is in large part led by the people that they're organizing. An organizer trains and develops people. An organizer has to have a, uh, you know, a political education, of course, and, is, and, is, and there's a sort of dialectic relationship with the people. But, but ultimately, um, you know, organizers are, are building something as opposed to just critiquing or as opposed to just a public analysis. And, and organizing is much slower work than, quote unquote, activism. Hmm. Uh, you know, I could, I could put together a digital strategy that will build you a following online very quickly. Right. Uh, I, cannot hand, I cannot put together a strategy that is going to guarantee that you can build a community or that you can bring together 300 people of varying backgrounds and get them to align around a particular issue that they all consider a priority together and then to move them toward acting on that priority. It's a much different type of endeavor. Mm. Um, and so, you know, that, that's just one thing. And, and then, you know, I think a lot of times uh, we talk about, quote unquote, left leaning causes and, and quite often it's, it's like literally just a code word for the LGBTQ agenda. And, and, but what happens is because we're afraid to say that we end up painting this really broad stroke. And so, you know, all of a sudden racial justice work gets vilified all of a sudden uh, work that critiques our economic structure gets vilified, Mm -hmm. oftentimes vilified by people who are quite comfortable in this economic structure and in their own bubbles and have, and are not threatened by it. Speak on it. You know what I mean? So, um, (laughs) but, but, you know, but to the work of dream, you know, we've, we've tried to, uh, to, to be in that common space that you were talking about and to, and to be as accessible to as many people as possible. And to go back to the point that Sister Najah made earlier about, you know, uh, uh, shelter, clothing, and food. I mean, you know, that, that is one of the central hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that we, that we talk about in our work, mm-hmm. you know, where he says that the, the, right of Adam's, the, the rights of the son of Adam are, are not but three, uh, shelter to cover their head, clothing to cover their nakedness, and um, food and water, food or in a piece of bread, mm. you know, and that's like, that is that, like, how can you disagree with that? How can you argue with that? Yeah. And so particularly that first part of the hadith around shelter, you know, is obviously our work around housing access is grounded in that. That's right. Yeah. If I can uh, add on uh, points to this beautiful commentary, I'd also like to mention uh, another group that's in our community who are activists, primarily not organizers. And I'm glad I mean, a lot of reward, Brother Mark, for that uh, clarification is that um, because I've been in and out of this uh, world and doing this work for quite a while, and many listeners may not know, um, there may be some naivety about some popular people in our community or how certain movements or organizations have come about uh, within our community that aren't grassroots, that actually outside people brought people into cohorts trained them a certain way, and then foundations funded certain people who did not have a national platform and actually magnified them. And once they got popular in the broader society, then they end up being uh, through uh, social media, uh, through getting a little buzz, got invited into Islamic conferences. The next thing you know, they're seen as being a leading activist voice on blah, blah, blah. But if you go and look at the money or look at how this person came about. Some of these people weren't grassroots activists. They really weren't doing that type of work. That it was other people outside of our community who had an agenda who funded certain things and gave certain people 
platforms, right? So I think that we we can't be naive uh, uh, about this. It's not to say that foundation money is bad or evil. It also depends on the cause. But there is a difference between getting money to fund uh, feeding the poor, uh, for uh, medical care, uh, for shelter, and then also in the name of activism or anti-Islamophobia work in the name of intersectionality, then injecting things into there as being intersectional, as being part of what Muslims should be championing, where in fact goes outside of, 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 of certain, like, I'm not talking about things that we're just ikhtilaf on, mm-hmm. right, uh, amongst the jurists. I'm talking about qati'i issues, like things that are incontrovertible, because we, we have things that are dhani in our tradition, which are speculative, which the Islamic tradition is very broad. But again, I go back to this. There are certain things that the, the, the uh, Mu'tazila and the Shia and the Ibadiyya, the El Ibadiyya and Ahlul Sunnah, there are certain things that have always been agreed upon that cannot be propagated or cannot be advanced or to be normalized or talked about in a good way in the name of intersectionality. And some of this, some of this has, has gone on. And, and I think that as LGBTQ uh, is, is an issue that highlights this, which I actually devote one chapter to LGBTQ engagement in the book of not going to extremes about dehumanizing people who uh, see themselves as that because that is a, a very un-Islamic extreme. But to actually champion it and wave the rainbow flag in the name of intersectionality or calling people allies and to say that, oh, you know, well, we need to make some space for people to talk about this as a positive identity with inside our massage, that's another extreme, mm-hmm. right? And there are people who have funded people in our community to advance this. And, and, and I'm not going to be shy about saying it, though I'm not going to call out any uh, uh, individuals or, or, or foundations, but I, I know it firsthand, right? And that's because my organization has been turned down money because I specifically took a principal span, span a stand for Care Michigan that said, I'm not going to advance this just to get this uh, – Access to the fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollar grant from such and such foundation, such and such society. I just can't do it because, uh, um, and that's Abido Dunya, is what Imam Hussein said that most people are slaves to a Dunya or, or, or Mal. I just can't prostrate to that money in the name of intersectionality. I, I, can't, I can't do it. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and I ask Allah as well to protect all of us mm-hmm. from bowing down to money, mm-hmm. right? bowing down to because I can be on this national platform or this national TV show that then that becomes like a false idol god like Wathan, right? So we ask a lot as well to protect us from that. Well, you know, it's, there's so much I wanted to pick up on, but your last point about the sort of the, the, the false idol or um, what becomes kind of the new um, um, standard by which we like almost like a, a principle of the faith is, and, and you talk about this issue of funding, you know, like a lot of times what happens is because we also live in this age, this sort of call out culture that is, that is, that is permeated online media, especially um, is that organizations that get maligned, um, you know, because they were associated with, you know, money from, um, for example, CVE money, for example, right? And and so, you know, saying no to CVE funding becomes kind of the maybe clarify uh, what CVE is. Uh, for yeah, count, countering violent extremism, right? Um, right, and that that becomes the kind of standard by which we uh, say, well, th- you know, these people are like this organization or this work is okay or this organization is not okay because they have either, uh, uh, either, um, been accused of or have in fact received CBE funding. You see what I'm saying? Like it becomes right. kind of there's, the, there's gatekeepers. The, well, yeah, the idea of gatekeepers or, or, or sort of like who, who assigns, you know, um, uh, orthodoxy to certain organ, you know, like, and, and gives credence to the work that organizations Yeah, yeah, yeah political orthodoxy. Right, I understand what you're right, saying. Right. So, and, and there's almost type of, like, political tech fear that goes on in our community, there you go, too. political tech fear. Thank and you. So, like, for instance, yeah. I personally am not in favor of CBE, but CBE is something about whether one gets money or not. That's speculative. Like, that's not something that is, like, firmly in religion that, say, if you uh, 
cooperate with CVE in any shape or form that that's haram and that's sinful, right? There's the, the, we can we can disagree right. upon that. Now, but, it, but 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 the same people who will be so harsh against organizations or certain scholars who may be doing soft CVE or getting CVE money mm -hmm. or took a certain trip somewhere uh, to. Uh, a country in the Middle East, for instance, we'll just we'll just throw that out there, right? <laughs> Thank you. No, no, they'll, they'll be really harsh about that. At yeah. the same time, in the name of intersectionality, some of these same organizational <laughs> activists will be hard on CVE, and then will openly advance something that Allah and His Messenger cursed, right? So, like, it, like which is not simply social political, but it's something that is in the realm mm -hmm. uh, 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 of of what's qati, right? What is like incontrovertible truth in Islam that again. Muslims have always agreed upon that as part of al Munkar for 1,400 years from the Sahaba, from Ahlul Bayt, from the Awliyaullah, right? So that is part of the, uh, uh, the bizarre nature of some of the things I see. And um, I have a lot of conversations with people about this, but yeah. I pick up the phone and call people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's another lost art today. <laughs> I don't go to Facebook and blast <laughs> sister such and such or brother you know, such and people. such. Uh, yeah, I pick up the phone and, or text them, can I talk with you? Right. Uh, you know, because that's the way you're supposed to give nasiha. Um, you know, if, if we call someone out firstly and we do it in, in public, we shame them. Hmm. While if we give people advice in private, then this is actually a way of showing them honor to show them dignity. This is actually a saying of Imam Musa al-Qadim, one of the great uh, Imams from Ahl al-Bayt, right? We're supposed to, this is the way we're supposed to do nasiha, That's right. right? But, but uh, now we have to call people out online and start a campaign <laughs> against them yeah. and boycott this scholar or boycott this activist. And that's not really the way forward. In I, my I, think, I think that goes, though, to something that's just a broader problem societally, which is this sort of everything has become performative. Yeah. Everyone has become the star of their own reality show. Mm -hmm. And so this notion of, well, if I call somebody on the telephone, no one's watching. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. But right. you can live stream the telephone conversation. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> you don't give people ideas. Right? The, 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 there's yeah. two thoughts that um, I want to reflect on. Um, one from Imam and, and, and one from Mark. Um, first of all, Mark, I want to congratulate you on something, and I hope the audience hears this loud and clear. Um, this is, what did you call it, a bee in my bonnet? Yep. Is that the, I've never heard that before. So this is <laughs> one of the bees in my scarf. <laughs> the idea that you were careful enough, that you had enough humility to step into the great city of Detroit, and I consider myself a daughter of Detroit, <laughs> and yes. not replicate and duplicate. Now, the strategic planner in the room knows this makes me insane. Mm -hmm. The idea that you found a void and you picked that up, this is the true Islamic nature. Because if you were to replicate and duplicate without assessing and seeing the void, then that means it was all about you mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. about the people. Mm -hmm. And this is really, and what Imam Dawood's talking about, it's about that principle-centered leadership mm -hmm. and about how we mentor that. And you're talking about the youth, but not only do we need to really mentor youth on Islamic, the, the Islamic um, parameters, mm -hmm. which actually aren't as restrictive as we may be teaching them to be, but we need to really teach principle-centered leadership, which is the highest form of Islam. And so uh, I, I say that because these are two people who are working um, as activists. And regardless, re regarding the grassroots thing, I want to tell you is firsthand that building a grassroots organization requires a lot of pain, mm -hmm. a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of tears, mm -hmm. a lot of uncertainty, a lot of hope. It's much easier to take the other route and to um, almost sell yourself yeah. to the money. Mm -hmm. But I've learned, even though I've never done that, that that is very short-lived. Mm -hmm. Because if it's not principle-based, if it's not principle-centered, if, um, if we haven't done the assessment 
as Muslim organizations to see where is the need, try to fill that void. Longevity comes from the way we think about things and then the way we approach them. But in the end, as leaders of any organization, it's going to come back to the person. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. And if we are aligning with God and our daily du'a is to make us his servant and to hire us in our service and lower us in our nafs, that's the way the day at Fajr has to start. Because if you don't get out the gate mm -hmm. with that kind of contemplation, that kind of alignment of your nafs, your heart, your intellect, you are going to make mistakes. So how you get out the gate every day is critically important. And then trying to maintain that, lowering that nafs. And it's tempting. Who's not tempted to be on NPR or at Harvard or whatever? I, I actually have said no to a lot of things because the alignment would build me, but it would hurt Zaman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, what am I taking with me? And I always think about that. Are those good deeds najahi? If they are, that's a big problem. If they belong to the other people, mm -hmm. that's where we need to be. It's a very, it's a difficult battle. It's that like uh, struggle and our nafs day in and day out. And so it's about training one's thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're human, right? That, that's what separates us from the, from the animal kingdom is that frontal lobe. So when you're down on the ground, I just want to say, and that frontal lobe is being humbled on that ground, Take that extra minute or two or three for not just the submission of the prayer, but for the submission of the self. Mm. And so that it's not just ritualistic, it's actually building your character. Mm. At a funeral um, for my uncle, somebody said, it's not the person and the body in the casket that matters. It's the character of the person and the casket that matters. Correct. It's true. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Wow, I mean, it's just a, a lot to. Uh, uh, I think we've covered a lot, and surprisingly, it's you know we've only gone about an hour into the show, which you know we can probably start, uh, you know, trying to bring the conversation to a close. I mean, I think we've opened up a lot of, uh, or, or we've touched on a lot of parts of the conversation that I did want to touch on, um, with regards to activism and where we are as a community, because I think, you know, like we 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 we, we, we talked about the dangers of sort of, you know, the online call out culture and, 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 and just kind of building and, and building up your own hype within, you know, social media or on online platforms. And I think some of the dangers of that, I almost like sort of missed the days where people just did the work for doing the work, you know, for the, for the sake of the work and not have to worry about branding and, 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 and how they look online. But I get the realities of that at the same time. Um, but, but maybe, you know, to sort of bring the, the, um, conversation to some sort of a conclusion. Um, from a practical point of view, um, I think in addition to some of the sort of theoretical issues that we've talked about with regards to activism, um, you know, I, 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 I talked about this issue of mentorship and, 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 not, and, and not recreating the wheel and not sort of knowing our lanes in terms of our, our, the various organizations that we have. I think one of the problems that that, that also that, that, that we as a community also face is that we're dealing with limited resources uh, to support the work that, that that organizations are doing and 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 what you're doing by creating more and more organizations is just diluting those like that funding and diluting the sources and so how do we sort of move away from that and this was kind of what I you know sort of uh, it wasn't what you framed as, the, or, or what you characterize, uh, Mark, as the softball question, but the idea of aligning ourselves with with other organizations that are doing work, if not exactly similar to what we're doing, or what the organization that I happen to be involved with, or you happen to be involved with, whatever is the sake or case, but but to aligning ourselves with with generally, um, generally aligning ourselves with other other organizations that are doing common, you know, projects that are related. So I, I guess from a practical standpoint, you know, how do we maybe create some sort of a conversation on a national level among the Muslim community where, you know, we can share the work that we're doing so that other organizations that are either fledgling or starting off or have been in the game long enough but aren't 
you know, well known outside of say provincial Detroit to, 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 to use your expression. Um, you know, you know, how do we start those conversations and when maybe creating some sort of a repository where people can find out more about organizations and things like that. So it's a real sort of practical, uh, practical guidelines for activists and activism in general? Um, I don't have a great answer to that. I'm, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll start, and then if, if something else comes to mind as the Please. other speakers, I can yeah. try to jump back in. But, um, uh, you know, I'll say with, with our work, I, you know, with Dream, I don't um, – you know, there's we have to strike a balance, right? You know, a couple of years ago we had uh, it's funny how time passes. So two summers ago we had an article come out in the Nation magazine about Dream, yeah. that was um, a really good piece. Uh, I was surprised. You, you never know what like a journalist is going to print about you at the end of the day when you agree to do stuff like that. But um, but the framing was was right and it was it was well written and and um, and the learning for us was actually that we probably should have tried to, we should have taken more advantage of it. Uh, you know, we didn't we didn't really promote it, uh, you know, super intentionally. You know, it, it got it got around, but we could have done a lot more with it. Um, the issue is that we we have to find a balance between. I mean, if 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 people if Muslims all across this country knew about Dream and we had still only completed one house, what's it worth, right? Like if if mm-hmm. the local community isn't actually bought into it, isn't right. aligned, isn't supporting, isn't moving in, isn't isn't doing the organizing work with us, isn't coming to our entrepreneurship classes, isn't coming out to our street fair over the summer, you know, isn't showing up at our neighborhood cleanups and board ups and tree plant, et cetera. If, if none of that's happening, like what, what's the publicity work? What's the like, right. You know, that, that, uh, so, so part of it is, it's just is striking that right balance. And uh, when you do have those opportunities, making sure that they're really aligned with the work and that they really ultimately come back to benefit the core of the work, as opposed to just being good publicity, um, That's a good point. In, as far as the organizations go, I mean, I would love to see a proliferation of organizations in our community in every city. You know, when, so when we talk about the CVE conversation, right? And I know that uh, that Tatleaf came under some pressure for some funds that they were going to accept or whatnot. Uh, you know, and I fall on the side of uh, you know not legitimizing the the surveillance state through accepting CVE funds. Period. Like I, that, that's that's my political analysis, mm-hmm. but. Uh, but I would tell anybody go go do go do the work that Talif has done, go replicate with with the with, go go make a difference in as many lives of folks coming back to this religion or learning about it as Talif. Go do that in your city mm-hmm. before you try to tear them down, mm-hmm. right? Like that's that's what I mean. We we're so you know, and part of that is just uh, you know, it's it's people. The call out culture comes from people feeling a lack of of power, feeling a lack of access, uh, but. Really, I think folks need to redirect their energies to, to building, mm-hmm. um, and that's mm-hmm. that's what it comes down to a lot of times. Uh, and don't wait for. Ta- I mean, I was there when Talif started in Chicago. I'm my wife helped to facilitate some of that. It was great, and I've 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 been happy to see it flourish. Don't wait for Talif to come to your city. Find the local scholar who you can work with or scholars to help build a similar institution that's going to serve in the same sort of way, yeah. um, you know, before you start lobbing bombs or or instead of lobbing bombs at all. Mm-hmm. So. Um, <laughs> So that that's just what I would say along those lines. I would, you know, and I think you know, uh, we're at a point now with Dream where we're trying to to get to a place where we can staff up. Finally, we've been entirely volunteer led for this whole time, mm-hmm. and we're grateful for all the volunteers who helped us kind of get as far as we have. Um, but we're certainly seeing the necessity to to like to professionalize the operation a little bit. Um, I hope that as we take that step. Um, we continue to grow the volunteer base, actually, uh, and that it doesn't become the, the the professional staff doesn't become a substitute for the people who are just putting in hours and hours of time out of their sheer commitment and love for the work and alignment with the vision. Um, you know, I think uh, you know things have changed as as you know over the last forty years as the economy has changed, and now you know for the you know we have two parent both parents working more often than you did in the 60s and so forth. But I think a, gen- a generation and a half ago, if you will, if not two, you saw uh, social organizations were much more um, enabled by the by the sheer will of volunteers and of people just coming together willing to donate their time and energy to build them. Right. Um, and I think if, that, if an organization is built like that, if it's built around people, if it's built around a membership, um, then it can be sustained, and that we won't we won't actually fall prey to like a you know 
diminishing resources. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. well, you know, Mark, I, 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 I mean, there's so much to appreciate of, of what you've said and what you've shared on the show. I mean, but if I could, you know, just I, I, I tend to almost to a fault speak in sort of abstracts and theoreticals. And so for you to just kind of name names and just kind of keeping it real, I, I, I want to thank you for that. Sure. Um, and so like, yeah, I mean, I was certainly, you know, referring, if not um, uh, in particular, at least in general, to organizations like Dali for others that have been sort of, that, that get caught up in this sort of online, you know. Uh, and I'm sure there are organizations that have brought a lot less value to our community that have accepted those funds and I would be a lot less generous to them. <laughs> but but, uh, but, but uh, Tatli in particular, Particular that struck yeah. a personal chord with me to Thank see them. You. Sort no, no, of and it, 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 right, right, and and without even Allah grant Shifa to see Osama and, Cannon, and, and, and we and we love him, and if Sidi Osama is listening, we love you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. No, it, and like Zucky made this point yesterday. Um, you know, we've been doing the show for six years now, almost, and we're at about eighty episodes in. But that first episode was with Osama Cannon, right? Yeah. And so, kind of a very special way to sort of launch the uh, podcast, as it were. But uh, sure. thank you for that, um, Imam Dawood, and you know, thank you, all, all three of you. It's just been a great conversation. Um, you know, I, I think um, uh, I, I should have said this at the outset, but I, but I, I and, I, and I say that very in, in, in the most sincerest sense that. I think we could have had any one of you on the show and made it a very, um, you know, insightful and deep conversation around not only your particular backgrounds but the work you're doing. So I, I almost I, I appreciate the fact that you agreed to be a part of a panel. Um, but I hope that we can have you back on the show individually to kind of flesh out and talk more in detail um, or, or to unpack, as it were, um, you know, with you know, to with regards to the work that you're doing. But uh, Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, we, we, we hope that the um, you know that, that our listeners enjoy the conversation. Um, you know, as always, um, you can reach us. You can reach out to us with questions, with comment, with, with comments, with feedback. Um, maybe Zucky, you can close this out and tell us where people can find us and find out more about the podcast. Yeah, well, uh, you can email us at diffusedcongruence at gmail dot com. You can also hit like on our Facebook page, which is facebook dot com slash diffusedcongruence. Uh, please go to iTunes and leave a review, leave a star rating. Every little bit helps. We also have a Patreon page where you can support us uh, uh, through monthly donations. Pervis, what's the? Uh, Patreon.com slash Diffuse Congruence. Yeah, you can become a, a monthly patron of the show. We've got some patrons in the audience, actually. So thank you so much for those who've, who have gone to the, our Patreon page and, and become patrons of the show. Um, every little bit helps, and not only in terms of feedback, but also um, in, in terms of becoming a monthly patron. So thank you for those who have done that. And I always say, even if it's a little as a dollar a month, I mean, that goes a long way uh, if, 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 you know, so whatever you can do. And uh, once again, I want to thank our panel. I'd like our audience to please give our panel a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to, and, and thank you to Z- uh, Zaman International for really, again, hosting us. Thank you, Najah. This was beautiful. And uh, I wish people could see what I'm looking at when you look at, when you overlook the warehouse and the, the, uh, the, the, like the work that you're doing here. I think it's so critical. So people can certainly find out more at zamaninternational.org or is it .com? dot org um and same with uh, dream of detroit is it's dream of detroit dot dream of detroit dot org yeah. dot org and imam dawood if people wanted to reach out to you find out more about the work that you're doing where can people do you know where, where can people find that find you seek you out as it were um they can uh just hit me up on facebook <laughs> there you go that's fine okay great so thank you again everyone and uh we look forward to having you on the uh having you on future episodes and uh, please do continue to listen to the podcast thank and, you. and thank you uh, Michigan yeah. for hosting Diffuse Congruence <laughs> great